morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I say good morning, but it might not be necessary morning wherever you are watching us for the moment, because you might be everywhere in the world. But nevertheless, I'm going to stick with my good morning and very happy, very, very pleased to be with you today to kick off the conference Connecting Tomorrow 2021. It's the first time ever that this conference is taking place as a fully hybrid conference, and that's why on one hand, I'm so happy to see people here looking at me. I feel their presence. At the same time also, I'm just as happy to know that over there, you are behind your screens, somewhere where I don't know even where you are and you're watching us, you're listening to us. And be sure, you won't be disappointed. You're going to have a conference program over the next three days, which is fully packed of very, very interesting topics, and we have plenty of things to share with you. My name is Peter Pöhle. I am, well, what you call a digital entrepreneur. Since now 2001, just celebrated my 20th anniversary being an entrepreneur in the digital domain, and I'm very, very happy being here with you. It's not for the first time that I'm moderating this conference. The last time was in 2019, but the conference dates back even to 2018 with the kickoff of the first 5G conference. Then 2019 and now 2021, and I was very, very happy to see that the, company, that the conference was growing year by year and becoming something which is absolutely amazing. We have, over the next three days, we have a speaker lineup which is absolutely world-class. We have workshops which are absolutely outstanding. We have here, for those who are on site, we have exhibitors over there showcasing new technology, and we have, of course, a very powerful online presence. There are a couple of things that I want you to know before we really start and before we dive into the topics. The first thing is a couple of housekeeping rules. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to sit down and not to move or anything. The housekeeping rules are pretty straightforward and relaxed. The housekeeping rules are simply that if you want to have a translation, the conference will be in English, but we have translation interpretations live ready for you from English to French, and also from English to German. The only thing that you have to do, if you're on the website, there is a little icon on the left side, a little globe symbol, a little globe icon. Just click on it, and it will guide you through the setup of your interpretation system. If you're on site here, we don't work anymore with these kind of old-fashioned headsets, which are anyway, in the time of pandemic, hygienically not acceptable anymore but instead we're working as well with the apps. So you can use, without any problems, your own smartphone with your own headphones. You just need to connect as well to the event app, and from there, again, you need to activate the translations, the interpretations, and you can choose your language. That's also a very nice example of connectivity, of something which was absolutely not possible, let's say, five or ten years ago. Many things have changed, of course. Then, next housekeeping rule. You want to ask questions? Please, ask your questions. We love to have your questions, not only during the keynote speeches, the case studies, the panel discussions, through all the different speeches. Don't hesitate to ask your questions and to put them into the Q&A section. We have on the left side as well an icon for the questions. You can go click on it, your questions will be collected, they will be published, and the other member of the audience can, without any problems, they can upvote the different questions to see which question is the most popular one. Use it, please, because the conference is living from interaction. And then, last but not least, we have also networking. And as for a good hybrid conference, there is clearly the possibility to network either in person here at the Lux Expo in Luxembourg, where you are free to mingle with the other people, to connect and to networking, but also on a hybrid level. We have on the internet website, you can see that we have a networking area. If you have correctly filled out your profile, you can just enter the networking and you're good to go. You can start mingling with the other people and building these connections, which are so valuable and so important for the future. Just use this tool, it will help the conference to be a real success. 
Now we have a conference which is fully packed of topics. I'm not going to go now into the details for the next two days, but at least for this day, for this morning only, I'm just going to go quickly through my program, what we are going to have on the list. Why do we need connectivity? How does connectivity impact our lives? 5G and beyond, wireless network economics and broadband, case studies, autonomous vehicles, connected automatic driving, tourism, life care, public safety, connectivity innovations with connecting rural areas. All this in one morning. I would clearly say, fasten your seatbelts, because that's going to be a hell of a ride with plenty of information, with top speakers. And I myself, as a moderator, I'm really looking forward to what is coming up, because that's going to be enormous and great to learn so many new things. When we speak about connecting tomorrow, then I like really to look into the past, because the past is defining the future. Not only today, but the future itself. And it helps also quite a lot if you look into the past to see what kind of short time frames were necessary to progress at enormous pace. Let me jump back 1985. I was back then, I was nine years old, and I remember myself receiving as a gift from my parents my first home computer. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a Philips VG8020 MSX, a home computer standard. Some of you might still remember the standard. It's extinct. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, even though it was a great thing. But I remember this computer. It had 80 kilobytes of RAM, totally limited compared to today. I mean, look, we have today, we have in our pockets, we have small supercomputers carrying around with us. This one, I need to connect it to a TV. Connecting it somewhere to outside of my room was literally impossible, at least for me. And some freaks I know, they were able to connect it over the telephone line and to connect with other freaks somewhere. But that was something so far away from me. So I had my little computer there. And if I wanted to do something useful with it, I had to type some program code in there with BASIC and uh, eventually buy some software, play some games on it. But it was very limited. But still, it was something which was opening up a whole new universe for me. And it showed me, wow, this is something which is the future. Fast forward by 10 years, 1995. That's 25 or 26 years ago from now. That was back then, 26 years, which is really not a lot. 26 years, and in 95, I got my first internet connection. And again, this was a disruption for me. All of a sudden, I was able to type in to the Netscape browser back then, www and an internet address. What a revolution for me to connect to internet sites and to get all the sudden information. There were thousands of internet sites back then. This was enormous, thousands of internet sites. And still, how limited have we been? I remember my first modem was a 28.8K modem, extremely slow. And still, it worked, it was nice. But compared to what we have today, 26 years today, just compare for yourself. You all remember how it was back then. A little fast forward also, 1997, I started my studying of Digitale Medien, which is today Media Computer Science, in Germany. I ended up living in the student accommodation housing, and we had for the whole house of students, we had an ultra-fast internet connection. We had a two megabit connection. And that was revolutionary back then, because all of a sudden, I had for the first time in my life, I had this great feeling, you are always on, 24-7 connected. I switched on my computer, I was connected at a speed which was incredible for me. Every time when I went back to my parents' house, and I had to connect over my, back then, 56 point whatever K my, uh, modem, it was so slow. But I was connected, and that was enormous. All of a sudden, Things came up, chatting with other people, connecting with people that you had never seen before, just being able to, to chat. And even though back then we had already smartphones, the so smartphones were feature phones, what could you do with the phones back then? Typing a couple of numbers, saving a couple of numbers, sending text messages? Yes, sure. But I still remember also when you had, I think, 100 text messages in my Ericsson, it was full. You need to delete the text messages again. 
connectivity. At some point, someone invented WAP, these kind of small mobile websites. They were not really successful. I think I never really used it because I didn't see much sense in it to have on a small display something, display which was not even as powerful as my Apple Watch today. But it was at least it was a step of becoming mobile. And then again, fast forward, 1999. I remember myself sitting at my student job. I became just a webmaster of a clothing company called Pimki in Germany. I was doing it as a student. It was pretty cool. And I remember myself sitting there in the office being connected with all the people, the different uh, actors in this company. And I still remember also how new many things still were. The director, the head of human resources, he came to me and he said, yeah, if you want to have some more information, look at Amazon.com. Okay, I was typing in E-M-M-E-R-S-O-N. He looks at me, he said with his typical German accent, no, 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 Peter, Amazon.de, please. I said, okay. Amazon. I never heard of Amazon. Today, every child knows of Amazon. My daughter knows perfectly well that you can order everything on Amazon, for sure. Google was just back then totally new, totally young. It was pretty amazing also to see how this has evolved. And then fast forward again. I remember myself being scotched literally in front of the screen and watching a live stream from a certain guy. In 2007 it was from a guy called Steve Jobs, who just introduced on screen a revolutionary internet device. It was a day where the iPhone was born, and I had a great feeling, here really something is changing, because all of a sudden, connection becomes really mobile, internet becomes mobile, and this will change kind of the world. And I was eager to get this device that we couldn't even get in Europe at the beginning, the iPhone 1. I wanted to have one, and somehow I managed to have a friend of mine bring it from America over there, so that indeed, in 2008, I had it. I was the first among all my friends who had the iPhone 1. And when you look at the iPhone 1 today, how limited again it was. No app store. The connectivity, it had Edge. It didn't have any 3G back then. Loading an internet site mobile was well, let's put it like this, not a real pleasure, but still, it worked already. And then all of a sudden, it went so quickly. And now, really big fast forward today, we are 2021. 2021, we are living in a world where we are constantly connected, where we all have our mobile devices with us, and still, we are only at the beginning. Even though, even though we have artificial intelligence in our pocket, without that we know even that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis artificial intelligence. We are constantly connected. We know that we have internet. Internet is not anymore something which is nice to have. Internet is something like electricity, which has to be. We need to be connected. I know it for myself. If my internet connection fails for some reasons, well, I cannot really do my work anymore even. And that's something which is very significant. And that's why connectivity is so extremely important. And that's why we need really to make sure that now we pave the road for the future. And that's why I'm extremely happy also to be with you here today to speak about the future, to discuss how the future will look like. How will our connection be in the next 10, 15 years? I was going back literally 36 years in my life, retracing a little bit the different technological developments. And you can see 36 years, that's really not a lot. If we see only what happened over the last 10 years, a very short amount of time. What will be in 10 years? What will be in 15 years? Welcome to find this out. I'm not necessarily qualified now to speak about these things. There are much more qualified people, and I'm very happy that we're having these qualified people with us here. The first person who is clearly qualified about speaking about this, but also who is at the right position to change the world, at least here in Luxembourg, but maybe also on a European scale, is our first speaker. I had yesterday with the organizers had a little chit-chat, and I said, how on earth am I going to introduce a person that any boy, everybody knows, a person that everybody knows what he's doing, what he has achieved in his life. Very difficult. That's why I'm going to make it very short. Dear Xavier, I'm going to introduce you simply as a visionary. I'm going to introduce you as a prime minister of Luxembourg, as a minister of telecommunication, 
and is a great guy who has a vision where we will go in the next 10 years. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, a very big and warm applause, also virtually, please, for Mr. Xavier Böttel. Dear guests, dear excellencies, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, I know it's early, and uh, I saw my one of my collaborator running around with the coffee. I just want to remind him that he never proposed me one. <laughs> Let me, I don't know where he's sitting, but so it's done. Let me start with a few words in English on why we are here also uh, this week to discuss uh, connectivity before I will switch also to French. So you see, I will use both languages. As you know, my country, Luxembourg, has uh, already an impressive coverage of Tom Knott digital infrastructure, and you may be wondering why um, such a strategy is necessary at all. The amount and quality of coverage seem to say, mission accompli, the work is done. However, the last five percentage of households of the country's coverage are still missing. Filling these white spots is very important because they are the most expensive ones and the most difficult also to cover. Even more importantly, they are the ones that help closing the social gap between those who have broken coverage and those who don't. For me, this is not a technology question. It's also a social one. And we saw the last uh, week and last month and even the last year how important good connectivity is. Um, I'm, in this country, a prime minister for the ones who are connected, but I'm also the prime minister for those who are not yet. And we have to do real, all the best that uh, the digital divide is not becoming a social cleavage. We had e-education, we have e-health, we had a lot of meetings, social contacts through the digital world. So, and all of you usually are not needed to be convinced, but imagine you would live somewhere where it would not work. And I'm sure yesterday night, in some households, some parents had difficulties to explain to the children, Facebook will come back, Instagram will work soon, WhatsApp will be okay tomorrow. Yes, because also we live today in a, in a situation where a digital world is part of our everyday life. And uh, why, that's the reason why uh, with this uh, COVID situation where we realized how important also this uh, digital risk of division is, I put this topic on the agenda and wanted to tackle it with this ultra high speed broadband strategy. We want digital transformation for each and everyone and we simply cannot achieve this symbol of progress without the ambition to close the digital divide today. With this strategy, we want to accelerate the transition of households and businesses to more efficient and also to more sustainable technologies. We want to accelerate the deployment of future-proof infrastructure while respecting technology neutrality. We need to ensure diversity of service providers and a healthy amount of competition on the market, on the market growing as fast as ours. And with this strategy, we put in place the internet of 20, uh, 25 and also beyond, just like the broken strategy of 2010 has done it for the network we use today. With small transparency for the consumer and more opportunities for the service providers. And we, ladies and gentlemen, we are, as we are meeting today, I know that a lot of you have deep background on ICT and telecommunication, which is not unusual for a conference about connectivity. But um, I urge you to, to, to visit the stands of our 5G pillars. And I've been to several uh, places just now. And what is important is that we, we have today um, our best efforts to show you radically new concepts in today's connectivity technology. And the Lux QCA Consortium will also be present at this conference, which is at least, to me, the most radical communication technology I've heard of. 
Of, 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 however, we have also tried our best in organizing discussions with definitely the, uh, the point beyond also technology and will help us advance as a society. This is not, not the conference reserved to telecommunication industry, but open to all our, our society. And allow me to switch in French uh, so that uh, also other participants are able, and I know that a lot of visit in virtual visitors are here today, uh, are um, following uh, in French. Um, J'ai pu m'assurer des progrès justement en visitant les stands et quand on voit ce qui est fait aujourd'hui, c'est encore différent de ce qui était fait hier et encore ce qui nous prépare pour ce qui va nous, a, nous, nous, nous attendre demain. Et du premier appel à projet, huit projets pilotes sont en cours, le deuxième plus ciblé en a généré justement trois, ils sont presque tous présents à la conférence et je vous invite vraiment à leur rendre euh, visite. Et ce sont des projets que je pourrais expliquer, et ça ce qui est important, facilement à ma mère. J'en discutais tout à l'heure avec... Euh, Madame l'ambassadeur de France, qu'il est important que la technologie soit quelque chose, quand je parlais tout à l'heure de division au niveau de la connectivité, on ne doit pas non plus avoir une division dans la société sur la compréhension de la technologie. La technologie est une chose, de pouvoir y accéder, mais l'autre, c'est pouvoir aussi la comprendre. Comment l'expliquer à ma mère Et pour moi, toujours un des motifs que j'aime le plus et des refrains que j'aime le plus pour lui faire comprendre quelque chose. Quand j'ai expliqué à ma mère que les virements ne se faisaient plus sur papier, mais sur... Téléphone, au début, elle a eu du mal. Aujourd'hui, elle réussit à le faire. Si j'explique à ma mère que demain, à travers son ampoule, elle aura son Wi-Fi, j'ai encore du chemin à faire. Mais c'est ça ce qui avance. Si je lui branche, elle trouvera ça super. Il faudra qu'elle comprenne comment y accéder. Donc, accéder aussi à, 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 au progrès est quelque chose de très important. Et on doit éviter que les uns puissent en profiter et les autres ne puissent pas en profiter. Ce qui est très important, c'est que tous puissent en profiter. Moi, j'aimerais remercier euh, ici vraiment tous ceux qui ont participé à l'élaboration aussi de, de, ce, de ce salon, de cette rencontre, et, euh, car nous, je vois les projets de, que nous avons lancés, que nous avons soutenus, et nous avons aussi des projets ici qui relèvent du domaine euh, des sciences, et je vraiment aimerais remercier les organisations bénéficiaires euh, de ces projets, et aussi, bien sûr, aux équipes dévouées. Et vous allez également découvrir le projet dont je viens d'aborder, le Lux QCI, pour lequel notre SES a le, a le lead et dans lequel l'État participe donc également. C'est un autre volet justement de la connectivité que nous, euh, nous touchons, puisque nous parlons en fait là d'une, je peux me permettre, d'une infrastructure futuristique. En tout cas, je dois vous l'avouer que pour moi, elle est. Mais elle nous aide en fait à nous préparer pour les défis en matière de, de, de communication du futur. Et j'ai bien compris que les travaux en, en lien avec euh, l'ordinateur quantique nous forcent à repenser la sécurité aussi de nos échanges électroniques. Et ces défis ont besoin d'une approche coordonnée au niveau européen. Et je suis fier de pouvoir dire que Luxembourg a été parmi les premiers pays fondateurs justement du projet euh, Euro QCA dans lequel le projet luxembourgeois s'inscrit. Et ce projet bénéficiera d'ailleurs d'un cofinancement communautaire. J'étais très content quand la, la présidente de la commission von der Leyen est venue au Luxembourg, qu'on ait eu un, 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 un échange vraiment important aussi euh, sur ce euh, projet. Et justement, ce soutien très concret de l'Europe, je, je, je le dis, ce n'est pas maintenant quelque chose que notre représentant de, des États-Unis, de l'ambassade des États-Unis, ne doit pas comprendre, mais l'Europe doit avoir une stratégie forte aussi à ce niveau-là. On ne peut pas se permettre d'être pris en étau, en fait, entre le côté de l'Atlantique et de l'autre côté d'un continent européen, de l'autre côté du continent européen, qui est le continent asiatique. Nous devons, en Europe, réussir aussi, à 27, avoir une stratégie forte et à, à, à réussir aussi à travailler ensemble. Et on ne doit pas voir les États-Unis ou l'Asie comme un ennemi. On doit le voir, comment est-ce qu'on peut travailler ensemble, mais aujourd'hui, les leaders dans tous ces domaines sont, la plupart du temps, viennent d'autres continents que le nôtre. C'est un challenge. Et je sais que très souvent, on parle européen, mais on acte local, on acte national. Chacun parle de vouloir travailler avec l'autre, mais regarde aussi de ce dont il peut bénéficier lui-même en tant que pays. Donc les stratégies européennes, mais je sais qu'avec le, le commissaire breton, nous avons quelqu'un qui a des visions aussi européennes très importantes, avec Mme Vestager, etc., etc. Nous avons des gens qui ont envie de faire bouger les choses. Et on doit le faire. 
au niveau aussi euh, du, euh, du digital. Et la Commission européenne, via la DG Réforme, a, a aidé justement le Luxembourg à affiner sa stratégie au, au niveau du, du 5G. C'est pour moi, c'est la plus-value justement européenne, quand certains disent à quoi sert l'Europe, mais c'est tous les jours quelque chose. Je n'ai pas besoin de parler de, du Covid check que vous avez aujourd'hui et qu'on puisse assister ici euh, à des réunions sans masque. Ce sont des projets européens qu'on a pu le faire aujourd'hui. Et euh, à travers des ateliers de formation, nous avons pu justement augmenter ici au Grand-Duché de Luxembourg le niveau d'expertise et nous avons pu soutenir justement ce débat aussi sur la connectivité. Mes sincères félicitations donc vont au consortium composé d'Everis, d'Incities et du List qui a réalisé justement ces travaux et vous pourrez justement cet après-midi ou si demain après-midi rejoindre les workshops qui sont organisés et qui sont issus de leur travail. Les experts de la DG Connect, qui sont basés ici aussi au Grand-Duché de, de Luxembourg et à Bruxelles, nous complètent euh, euh, parfaitement. Et vous allez pouvoir découvrir leur analyse et leurs travaux justement stratégiques euh, à pas moins de trois occasions tout au long de cet événement. Et aussi un grand merci au Digital Pôle euh, de ma part. Alors que, que, je vous l'ai dit, le Luxembourg dispose de très bonnes infrastructures numériques, vous pouvez aussi euh, vous poser la question, à quoi sert justement une stratégie nationale d'ultra haut débit, euh, alors que les chiffres semblent dire, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, la mission est faite. Le fait que nous avons développé d'excellentes infrastructures avec de fortes réserves de capacité, c'est un travail accompli, oui, au cours des dernières années, et je fais partie de ces politiques, et pourtant je sais que c'est rare, qui remercient aussi ceux qui étaient là avant moi. Je sais que sans un Jean-Louis Schiltz, aujourd'hui, je n'aurais pas les infrastructures dont j'ai besoin. Il faut le reconnaître en politique aussi, quand j'ai des prédécesseurs qui ont fait du bon boulot. Et euh, ces derniers petits pourcents, je sais qu'ils ne sont pas intéressants pour certains, financièrement, économiquement, mais ils sont capitales pour vivre dans une société. Ils sont capitales pour pouvoir euh, éviter ce clivage dont je viens de parler euh, tout à l'heure. Et euh, pour moi, ce qui est, ce qui est très, très important, c'est de, de, de voir que nous allons accélérer le, le déploiement et justement euh, accélérer aussi les, les décarter, vouloir toutes les barrières qui existent et que euh, l'accès soit aux infrastructures soit évolutif, mais aussi soit futur pauvre et soit surtout garanti aussi euh, à tout le monde. Et nous devons aussi protéger le consommateur. Je sais que de temps en temps, j'ai des discussions avec certains collègues étrangers qui disent « Oui, mais vos règlements sur la protection des données, etc., etc., est-ce que ce n'est pas trop sévère » Avouons-le nous-mêmes, nous sommes utilisateurs. Est-ce que nous faisons toujours attention Est-ce que nous n'avons pas tendance à accepter facilement, sans lire, toutes les conditions C'est pour ça que nous avons des règlements européens qui sont là aussi, qui sont plus forts par rapport aussi à des grands groupes et qui nous permettent souvent de protéger le consommateur euh, final. Et... Euh, pour nous, nous, nous mettons en, en, en route aujourd'hui l'Internet de, de 25, voire au-delà, tout comme la stratégie au débit de, de, de 2010. Et pour, pour mon gouvernement, c'est quelque chose que j'ai voulu faire moi-même aussi, en tant que ministre euh, du digital, et être Premier ministre est quelque chose qui est très important. Car je pense que le digital aujourd'hui, et ça a été quelque chose que nous voyons aussi de temps en temps dans d'autres pays, a très souvent été vu de manière silo on a vu de manière verticale. Alors que pour moi, tout ce qui est digital doit être vu de manière horizontale. En politique, le digital concerne tout. Ça concerne la ministre de la Santé, ça concerne le ministre des Finances, ça concerne le ministre de l'Économie, ça concerne le ministre de l'Éducation nationale, ça concerne le ministre des Infrastructures, des Transports, etc., etc. Et donc, en tant que Premier ministre, ayant une compétence horizontale aussi pour le gouvernement, permet justement d'avoir une coordination qui est meilleure au niveau euh, du, de, de, de la coordination de notre gouvernement. Le plus grand regret qu'on peut avoir, c'est si souvent, entre gouvernements, et je l'ai vu dans d'autres pays, le ministre du digital veut faire sa propre soupe et pas avec les autres. Euh, je le regrette et je pense que le choix qui a été fait au Grand-Duché de Luxembourg de mettre le digital au niveau du chef du gouvernement est important. Sauf erreur de ma part, je crois qu'en Allemagne, ça a été aussi le cas, justement, que la chancelière s'est adjointe aussi à un secrétaire d'État au digital pour pouvoir avancer euh, dans ce dossier. Bon, en tout cas, je tiens à remercier encore une fois le, le SMC. Je suis désolé, je ne vais pas pouvoir rester parce que j'ai rendez-vous avec notre chef d'État euh, ce matin euh, avant de partir en Slovénie pour parler avec mes collègues européens des problèmes qu'il y a sur notre continent, qui sont la situation dans les Balkans, situation qui doit tous nous préoccuper, car souvent on veut apprendre du passé et on parle de ce qui s'est passé en 39-45. On ne doit pas oublier qu'il y a moins longtemps que ça, dans les... Voilà, j'ai tout qui tombe. 
Il y a moins longtemps que ça, dans les Balkans, nous avons connu aussi des tensions et actuellement, la situation n'est pas idéale. Donc, il faut tout mettre en œuvre pour éviter un nouveau conflit dans cette, dans cette région. Et au niveau du digital, je peux juste vous, vous dire que le Luxembourg n'est peut-être pas le plus grand point que l'on peut trouver sur une carte, mais c'est au niveau digital parmi les leaders, au niveau infrastructure parmi les leaders, mais surtout... Un pays où peut-être vous avez une idée, vous avez un projet, vous avez envie de faire quelque chose. Et les, les, les représentants d'Orange m'ont dit tout à l'heure qu'ils sont très fiers d'être au Grand-Duché de Luxembourg, car ils trouvent l'écosystème nécessaire pour pouvoir justement lancer des choses, tester des choses. Et surtout, je peux vous dire que vous avez un Premier ministre qui est fier. Je l'ai déjà dit à plusieurs reprises, je ne le cache pas. Je ne suis pas le Premier ministre qui a envie de donner un matelas aux gens pour se reposer. Je suis un Premier ministre qui a envie de donner un trampoline à chacun pour sauter plus haut pour avoir envie de réussir, pour avoir envie de faire, pour avoir, euh, être fier de ce que l'on réussit euh, à faire et que le gouvernement n'est pas là pour vous embêter, pas pour vous mettre des conditions, pas pour vous mettre des restrictions, pas pour vous mettre des législations, mais au contraire, voyez-le comme un partenaire qui est prêt à vous aider. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Xavier. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Xavier Buttel, Minister of Telecommunication, you pointed it out absolutely correctly. We are not an island. We are international. We need to work together. And that means also regulations. I'm going to keep it now short with my introduction for the next speaker. John Giusti, you are the Chief Regulatory Officer of the GSMA. And you're going to tell us a couple more things about how regulations on an international scale are working. A very warm welcome for John, please. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is truly my pleasure to be here today as we turn our attention to connecting tomorrow and we work to build a better future for our citizens, for our businesses and for our society. I would like to thank the government of Luxembourg for the invitation and for its digital leadership as it works to uh, drive innovation and investment in intelligent connectivity and services. So today, I would like to share my thoughts from the perspective of the mobile industry, but of course, I look forward to hearing the thoughts from others as well. At the GSMA, we very much work to unify the entire mobile ecosystem, to underpin the technology and support the interoperability that makes mobile work, to advance enabling policy environments, to monitor emerging trends, and to leverage mobile connectivity to address some of the largest societal challenges that we face today. As we now emerge from the experience of this pandemic, as we start to gather again, to socialize, to conduct business in person, and even to travel as I did to get here today, I think we all do so with a greater understanding of the importance of digital connectivity to our lives and to our livelihoods. When the virus upended daily life, education, business, it was digital connectivity that in many ways was the steadying hand, to be relied upon, to be trusted. When the GSMA this summer convened at the Mobile World Congress Barcelona, it was still under very challenging times, and we had scores of government ministers and heads of telco regulators nonetheless prioritize being there in person to share their experience and best practice. And I view this very much because they recognize that the path to eco economic recovery is a digital path. And I think it's fair to say that the importance of robust and resilient digital connectivity to society and to all segments of the economy has really never been clearer. So now is the time for us to reflect and ensure that our economic and telecom policies and regulations are actually aligned to our digital ambitions. Since early 2020, we have seen what access to mobile services and solutions has meant to the ability of European citizens to adapt and to respond to the pandemic. And in some cases, we have been reminded what a lack of access to these services and devices needed for remote working, remote education can mean to people as well. The European mobile industry has strived to play its part in keeping consumers and businesses connected. This was despite dramatic changes in data demand and consumption patterns by, for example, zero rating educational services, harnessing the power of mobile big data solutions for epidemic modeling and in some cases, providing support and direct funding for hospitals, frontline workers, and other healthcare initiatives. With economic recovery on everyone's agenda, 
What the growth drivers will be is a very critical question for those of us here today. And I'm increasingly convinced that 5G penetration will be an important one. But 5G penetration also very much depends on whether the policy enablers are in place, such as timely and affordable access to the spectrum that is needed to drive mobile networks, and this is across various frequency bands. Now, I do know that spectrum is not the most exciting topic for many, but it will be essential to address this if 5G is to reach its full potential. If we in Europe want to stay competitive in the global 5G race, to drive the necessary infrastructure deployments, to fuel sustainable growth, and to trigger a green and digital transformation across the continent, government and industry need to work even more closely together to eliminate barriers and to support sustainable investment in network infrastructure. We've seen the impact that rapid deployment and adoption of 4G services have had in Europe, and 4G is now the region's leading mobile technology. Last year alone, Europe's mobile operators contributed 470 billion US dollars to regional GDP and provided directly 1.2 million jobs. So 4G connections are going to be peaking, we think, probably next year. And 5G uptake will continue to grow. And we think that's very much driven by an increase in consumer interest, a wider number of compatible smartphones, as well as expanding 5G network coverage. And European operators are expected to invest 145 billion euros in networks between now and 2025. And almost 90% of that will be on 5G. This will translate to 276 million 5G connections over the period, with the highest adoption rates in the Nordics and here in Western Europe. There are, however, some constraints that will impact this, with limited subscriber growth, regulatory barriers, and intense competition. There will be a subdued, although stable, core mobile revenue outlook. As we talk about 5G as well, there is one global trend that is emerging. It's a bit different from the previous generations of technology. And that is the interest from businesses in 5G standalone. In other words, with no dependency on the 4G network. Our data suggests that 5G standalone is now on the path to becoming mainstream globally, with 38% of 5G operators committed to standalone deployment to serve the enterprise sector. We believe that 5G will be the future for both business to business as well as business to consumer applications, enabling enterprise and governments to change society and impact lives through intelligent connectivity. And that's what we call that unique opportunity that we have by bringing together 5G, AI, IoT, and big data. We're starting to see the emergence of real 5G use cases. I saw some here on the floor at Lux Expo just this morning, and many more are yet to be revealed. So remember, we have to think back and reflect that when 4G was first rolled out, nobody could have possibly imagined that combined with the advances in handsets, that it would fuel the platform economy we have today. So now with 5G in healthcare, we can imagine real-time clinical expertise as paramedics transport patients to hospital, saving lives. And with 5G in manufacturing, augmented reality can allow complex tasks to be performed remotely and precisely improving worker safety and productivity. But as the Prime Minister alluded to, connectivity is about more than the bottom line. In my many years of working with the mobile operators, it is clear that they see themselves as more than just a business, but also part of the community they serve. Mobile operators are, after all, not some far-off company, but in all cases, a nationally licensed one that is operating on the ground with employees and subscribers in every country around the world. So many do feel a duty to contribute where it matters. In 2016, the mobile operators decided to be the first sector to commit as a whole to the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Each year, we at GSMA measure and track progress against each of these goals and publish a report alongside the UN General Assembly so that we can identify progress, but also hold ourselves to account for any gaps. We currently are measuring highest in our contributions, not surprisingly, to SDG 9, Industry Innovation and Infrastructure, but also SDG 4, Quality Education, and SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being. But of course, progress depends on connectivity, and we already have heard about the challenge of covering white spaces. Great strides have been made to expand digital inclusion, but I do think it is very fair to say that there is a mammoth task that lies ahead. Globally, network investment has seen mobile internet coverage 
In other words, areas where there is no mobile internet coverage drop from 1.8 billion people to just 450 million people in six years' time. So a pretty extraordinary drop. Still a large number of people not covered at all. But over this same period, the usage gap, meaning those people who live within mobile internet coverage but are not using it, has remained steady at 43% of the global population, or 3.4 billion people. So just think about that experience as we've come through this pandemic. That percentage of the population did not have the same opportunities those of us here did. And no company or government will be able to close this gap on its own. So we're gonna to have to work together to ensure that the opportunities that come with mobile internet usage are open to all, even where digital skills, literacy, or affordability get in the way. And finally, with COP26 taking place next month, I would be remiss if I did not mention climate action. In 2019, we announced an ambition for mobile operators to be net zero by 2050 at the latest. Now, many are going much faster, and we are really pleased at the level of commitment that we've seen and that has now been recognized by the United Nations race to zero as the first breakthrough sector. But mobile sector emissions, such as constructing owning networks, the use of handsets, only account for 0.4% of global emissions. What is really exciting to us is that mobile connectivity is a real opportunity to enable other industries to reduce their carbon emissions by a factor of at least tenfold. At the GSMA, our vision really is to unlock the full power that connectivity can bring so that people, society, and industry thrive. I have no doubt that 5G will play a key role in connecting tomorrow. But to get us there, the mobile industry will need to continue to invest, innovate, and importantly, build strong partnerships with governments, international organizations, and other industry verticals to deliver on this better shared future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. Indeed, you pointed it out. So many people are either not yet connected or they are connected, but they don't grab the opportunity to be connected. We need to really make sure that there is not kind of a divide between those who are not connected and who are connected. One of the things, and now I'm leapfrogging a little bit from one topic to another, to be connected at all or to get access to the information is the role of the global top-level domains. And there is one association which is taking care of exactly these things, the ICANN. I think everybody who's connected probably has heard already of the ICANN. So I'm going to spare you now the details about what exactly the ICANN is doing. But I'm very, very pleased and very happy that we have our first virtual speaker and he's connected. If he would not be connected, actually, then who could connect if it would not be Göran Marby, the president and CEO of the ICANN? Göran, uh, welcome to you. The floor virtually is yours. Big applause also from here, from the room and worldwide. Thank you, thank you very much, and I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, I am virtual. Uh, I'm sitting in uh, I'm sitting in my home office in Los Angeles, and thanks to the internet, uh, I still rather would have been with you in Luxembourg. First of all, I would like to thank the Prime Minister for his kind invitation and congratulate the Department of Media, Telecommunication and Digital Policy for organizing this event. I also would like to thank Claudine Carriger, who represents Luxembourg on the Government Advisory Committee in ICANN, for her contribution to our work. I still would like to, to explain a little bit what ICANN actually does. Uh, every time you go online, regardless of which device you're using, you hit about something that actually originates from us. Uh, we are technically, you know, we often call this the identifiers. And the identifier is really the language and the protocols that all computers, devices, and everything uses to be able to connect. If there's not coming from us, it's not the internet. The, the, and what I'm gonna talk about today is that, as the previous speaker has talked about, is that the internet is not done. We might think that when you sit and use your social media or you use your emails or you book your flight ticket or you just chat with your friends, that internet's done, but it's not. And I want to point on something that we've not done. We are about 5 billion internet users today, someone claims. Actually, I don't even know how to calculate that. The interesting thing is that we only have 1,600 ways of identifying ourselves on the internet. 
That's what you call the .com, the .se, or .lux, or whatever you call it. There's only about 60 for 5 billion. And most of those things are actually in English or in Latin script. That means that we have that, that means that we are stopping people from to make it possible to develop communities based on their own narrative, their own possibility of surprise on the internet. This might surprise you. But remember that we left to write. I did like a script, just because I have a copy. I speak it up. And the expression goes for a very special part of the region around the world. I think that this is why we don't take the money of areas around the world capacity. Because people are smart. They're willing to pay for a service when they can see something get it out of it. Is it the only thing they get out of it is to go on American, English, or European uh, web pages. They don't see the local that would not help local businesses at all. So we think it's all those things goes together. Also, with the previous speaker talking about the ability for, for investments in those countries, somewhere it has to be based on the knowledge. Well, it's kind of interesting that less than 20% of the email service around the world can read Chinese script. Less than 15% can read Arabian script. 2021. So what are we doing about this? And, and to be honest, it, it is it has to be seen. When I can we actually, I can just celebrate um, our birthday a couple of days ago, and also we just celebrated five years since we did what we call the transition, which is that the part, the last formal contract with the US government was relinquished. Um, we there is a history because of the way the tech was rolled out. And that's why we asked are today. So what are we doing? So one thing that we do is, uh, is that we work with a lot of regions, uh, regions, countries, governments, uh, multi in, also in multi-state development to create something we call universal acceptance. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here, because many of you are in the business of making or being service provider uh, to your customer to make sure that those systems can actually read something else than that script. And also recognizing that the Prime Minister also spoke in French, and language that I have studied for five years and still can speak, unfortunately, is if you compare that to English-speaking websites, there are more English ones than French. Which is interesting in some of the regions of the world where French is the predominant language. So, I can right now in the process uh, of doing what we call, that, or a technical way, what we call the next we are working on a way to make sure that we can have more identifiers around the world to make it as I said, possible for people to use their own keyboard, their own narrative, their own language, their own script to build identi ident uh, identities on the internet. Because we believe that the internet has to be continued to be diverse. And I'm, uh, today for many, which we might have seen over the last days, is that many things that social media on the internet we all know that when you go into social media, I'm using it as well, it's five, five minutes. You actually leave the internet and you go into someone. By making sure that you continue to develop the internet, we are talking about it, is to make sure that you create a diverse internet, which is local. Because internet is acceptance that is both local and global at the same time. The underlying factor is that we need to make sure we can connect to the internet. It's not only about the infrastructure, which is important. Without uh, the ability for connectivity, there will be no internet. But people are smart. They want to make sure that they can come back on the investment. And we think that the work fighting others, like telephones, like mobile operators, others, we can actually make sure that the internet can come even more global. We need to make sure that we create the second place on the internet for everybody. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Göran. Indeed, we still have a long way to go. Still a lot of things to do. This applies also to connectivity. I'm very pleased that we have now on stage the next speaker, Paul Lee. Paul, you are the head of tech for the media and telecoms research from Deloitte in the UK. And you're going to tell us a little bit more about that we are with connectivity still only at the beginning. Indeed, when I remember in 2019, when we had the last 5G conference, we had kind of a test connection here for 5G. That was all. Now today, I have my 5G connection on my phone here. But still, if I'm driving just three, four kilometers outside of the city of Luxembourg, I'm switching back to 4G. And this is kind of, I think, the standard in many other regions. And connectivity is not only what you see on your cell phone, but so many other things. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody who's connected, very warm applause for Paul E, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. And it's uh, a pledge to be here. Uh, I've been to uh, Luxembourg many, many times in the last 20 years, perhaps 30 or 40 times. Uh, but yesterday was the first visit in two years, and the first time that I had to get uh, a visa, which is here just in case anybody wants to see it, to come from the UK. So, good times. Um, so. I'm going to be talking to you today about um, what we see happening in the connectivity space. And the core message I want to give is I believe we've only just begun when it comes to connectivity. We're still barely connected. Now, in the era of 5G, and given you know, what Peter was just saying about you know, a few years back, it was an experiment, and now we have coverage. But the thing is, we will be far more connected in the future. There is a lot more connectivity yet to happen. And when you think about what is possible, think about all the things that you would like to do if connectivity were to permit you uh, to do that. Now, when I look at the um, reason as to why we have connectivity, it's a fundamental building block. It's a core technology. It's a platform on which applications are built. And on top of that, you get the reinvention of industries. You get the enhancement to economies. So when we look at what are the structures which are out there, so we've got fiber to the premise being deployed. It's very advanced in somewhere like Luxembourg, as uh, the Prime Minister was saying. But in many other markets, it's still very, very slow. Um, but there is plenty of scope for improvements. And we're still rolling out 4G in many markets. Um, and 5G um, is a work in progress, uh, and we have things like standalone 5G to look forward to. But they enable new applications like machine vision, like machine learning. And without the movement of files, without the movement of files at a good cost per gigabyte, then we can't get the enhancements in machine learning that can enable applications such as those being shown on the uh, floor over there. And when you have all of these developments, then you can start looking at the reinvention of a lot of um, industries. So this could be the reinvention of manufacturing. It could be the re reinvention of air and sea ports. Um, it's a reinvention of governments. There is still so much more that could happen. And yesterday, I was doing a talk um, virtually to a um, group of people in Saudi Arabia, and they were asking, when is it that digital transformation will finish? I don't think it ever will do, because the human spirit is to keep on innovating, to keep on improving, and that will provide more and more basis for more and more digital transformation with connectivity at the core of that. Now, the thing is, when we look at 5G, and I talk to a lot of people, they go, but things are very slow. So if we go back to 2017, and you may remember scenes like this. This is from the Mobile World Congress, 2017. And you have bold visions of the future, such as 8K virtual reality over 5G. 
So where is our 8K virtual reality over 5G? The reality is we're not there yet, and we won't be there for some time. But you need to be patient because technologies take a long time to deploy. We've yet to fully roll out all of 5G. There is really 17 still to come out in 2023. So in 2021, where are we? I just want to share you, with you some research that Deloitte does um, every year, um, looking at the state of adoption of different technologies. And when you look at the state of adoption of 5G, what you can see over here is it's pretty low across these countries we've got here, about 7% on average across this range of countries. And if we look at attitudes towards 5G, one of the things which is really interesting is a lot of people who have 5G can't tell the difference. Now, why is that? That's partly because we don't yet have the applications that make 5G stand out, the biggest one of which at the moment is congestion. Social distancing muffles the business case for 5G at the moment, but that will all go away. Now, you'll also notice that um, of the countries which are least able to tell the difference between 5G and not 5G, the UK leads. Um, and in terms of why is it people buy phones, 5G is quite down, low down the list. And again, that might look like there is a resistance to 5G, but I would say it doesn't really matter because all of this demand will become soaked up over time. And I remember the launch of 4G. And again, the perception was always, it's a slow start, and 3G too. And the first job I ever had was looking at the transition from 1G to 2G and trying to explain what that would mean back in the early 90s. And back then, we could not tell what was going to be happening with 2G because we hadn't really let it loose on people yet. And one thing I would say is the telecoms industry is very good at providing the core infrastructure, and then people, enterprises, app developers are very good at finding out, so this is what it's going to be used for. So if I look at 2020, so we've talked about 5G and the consumer. One thing we talked about a lot at Deloitte was 5G and the enterprise. And we, what we talked about then was, so what's going to happen with um, enterprise demand? 2020 was a strange year, of course, as we all know. But one thing that we had predicted was we'd expected about 100 companies to be involved in 5G trials. Then we upped that to 1,000 globally being involved in 5G trials. Now, the thing is, a 5G trial is quite easy to do, a proof of concept. It's very, relatively low investment. But I think the expectations were probably a little bit too high as to what 5G could deliver in its first year or its second year. But the re, you know, so when again we look at why is it that these applications, these proofs of concept aren't turning into full deployments, it's because the technology is still relatively immature. We don't yet have the benefits of things like network slicing, which are yet to come through in the next release of 5G. So my message around there would be to be um, patient because all of these technologies will be deployed because they add value, because they transform industries. And that's what really matters when it comes to 5G. And so what I would say is, sure, you know, when we look at how is 5G doing today, the, the metrics don't look that great, but I can definitely see foundations being laid for future demand for 5G. So when we look at, you know, why is it people are buying phones at the moment? And this is some data for the UK, but it could be similar for any country. The top reasons as to why people are buying phones are all to do with using their phones more. That means using more connectivity. And 5G may be low down on the list, but that's because at the moment, we don't really understand what the applications are for 5G. So at the moment, the biggest application for 5G is doing a speed test. And so people who do lots of speed tests tend to be people working in the industry or just a little bit strange or a bit of both. So 
Those applications will come, with the biggest application, I expect, being congestion. And when we look at you know, what's going to be happening with um, device access, with penetration, so is there growth in the market? So what's very clear is the number of smartphones out there and the number of tablets isn't going to shift very much in terms of penetration. But when you look at 2 billion devices being added, so 1.5 billion smartphones being added each year, each of them generates a lot more demand for connectivity. So if you bring out a phone which has a chipset with 16 billion transistors and can do 16 trillion operations per second, all of that is about enabling better and better applications that can be used with the connectivity that's available. Now, when we think about, um, you know, I remember a few years ago, um, and normally I would travel to about 20 countries per year, and one of the questions I'd be asking of all the clients we go and see is, what is the big application for connectivity? And in one country, uh, so this was in Moscow, talking to one of the telcos, they just said, the application for 5G is more mobile, which was very simple, but also absolutely true. So the reason why you move to new generations of technology is to be able to have a lot more connections in the same space. So when people go to concerts, what they like to do, having spent a few hundred euros per ticket, is to live stream what they're seeing to their friends and family to make them jealous, um, but also to share the moment um, with them. And for that, you need really good connectivity um, to work. Now, in terms of applications running over private mobile networks, so what we see at the moment is um, a lot of applications that are running over um, 4G around ports. And they make a big difference because if you can load a container ship faster, you can put another layer of containers on top of it. You can put up to 22,000 containers on a ship. So a lot of these ports are going automated currently over 4G networks, but the next thing will be to move them over 5G networks as the technology becomes available, as they can increment value. And because ports will always compete with each other to carry freight, you'll always have upgrading of technology coming through. And one of the other things which has been talked about a lot at the moment is the intelligent edge. So if you go to the exhibition area, I'm sure that there'll be some examples there of where you're combining improvements in edge technology, improvements in connectivity, improvements in machine learning to deliver applications. So this example I'm showing over here is all about doing um, spot checks for brand new stainless steel fridges. So if you have a human doing the inspection, um, you can have errors creeping in. But if you have a machine doing that work, then the error rate can be a lot lower, and the quality will be constant um, all the way through. Now, these applications are still trials, but the general tendency is to have more and more automation over time. And what about fixed networks? We talk a lot about mobile networks. And effectively, every network is um, the same network at its call, what differs is that some networks terminate with a Wi-Fi connection and some networks terminate with a cellular connection. But effectively, it's the, all the same underlying core network. And we see lots of growth and demand for that too. So one example over here. So this is um, some data from Ofcom in the UK looking at time people are spending on the internet. And I expect that will continue to grow. But what this reflects over here is the time that people are aware that they're spending. So that's active usage of the internet. Passive usage of the internet is where you will see a lot more growth. Monitoring services, updates to machines, video streaming, so all of those will grow and grow. Most consumers aren't really aware of how much um, internet they're actually using because they just think about the active usage when they're controlling the interaction. Um, and in terms of what we upload, what we create, so we've focused a lot historically on downloads, but think about the uploads, so the content creation. So one big data point that came through last week was TikTok 
reaching 1 billion monthly average users. The fastest time that anyone has ever managed to, um, to do that. So and a lot of what TikTok implies is uploading more and more content um, to the web. Netflix released this data last week. This was showing how many hours were spent watching its content. The number one was Bridgerton. As your telecoms people over here, you'll probably try and cal calculate what was the total number of gigabytes sent. So you can probably work out you know, how many people watched, how many hours, the ratio of 4K to HD to SD, and you get to about two petabytes downstream. But we're still at a very early age in terms of um, smart TVs, usage of smart TVs, the availability of services like um, Pluto.tv, which are moving broadcast to streaming. So in the US, about 26% of content goes over an on-demand um, link. What happens when it's 50%? What happens to demand uh, for networks at that time? And then we're currently at 4K. We're going to move to 8K. We are moving over time to perfect screens with um, the whole array of colors which the eye can see, with lightness, um, every degree of lightness, up to 10,000 nits that the eye can perceive. We're moving towards perfect screens, which will require a lot more bandwidth than we are using um, today. And the cost of creating those tools becomes lower and lower. I remember going to IBC in 2012 and seeing 8K cameras, 84 kilos they weighed each, and they were priceless because there were about three of them in the world at that time. Now you can buy them for under 10,000 euros. So that's the progress that technology is always delivering, that constant iteration. And monitoring has yet to go mainstream. So we'll look at um, all the connected devices that people have. The number of cameras is going to grow because things like security cameras, there is no limit to how many security cameras you could have because there is no limit to, I guess, paranoia or the need to be um, safe. And when it comes to health, now we talk a lot about remote surgery, but I think one of the biggest increments that's going to happen is a lot more monitoring by things like smartwatches. For a lot of males in many European countries, there is very little data gathered between the age of about 15 and 50. But smartwatches can start gathering that data and provide a lot more data to them. So where I see where we are right now, so connectivity has made tremendous advances over the last 10 years, but we are still barely connected. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Paul. Just bear a little bit with me, just for one second on stage. Um, <clears throat> it was quite interesting, actually. You pointed out quite a lot of um, video, actually, that was driving now the transition from 4G to 5G. Indeed, I have the feeling, when I see also myself the usage, 4G, if you just want to consume some video, that's roughly enough. Uh, do you think that people create this awareness or have this awareness uh, or is it something that could simply come like this as a normal transition that they feel okay now it works seamlessly if I want to upload my videos that they expect it simply or do you think that it's something that they really realize that now a new technology is in place I think what will happen is so 5g provides an upgrade to the um, availability of, of high-speed data and um, at the moment when we can't upload um, because 4G works perfectly if there aren't many people around you. So when you get a lot more people um, in a space, then it will get congested. So when you get people moving to 5G, um, and they're the ones who can actually um, send that connection, or their network has got that capacity, then the people with 4G will feel left out. That's what drives lots of um, demand for upgrades over time, is other people get jealous, so they want to upgrade. For sure. um, that's what happens with smartphone upgrades. Do you think um, that now over the next years it will be not much more the question anymore, am I using my fixed line or am I using my 5G connection or maybe 6G connection at some point or will it be simply just the normal that I have wherever I am a perfect internet connection? Yeah. So from the consumer perspective, that is ideal. So consumers just want it to work and want it to work brilliantly and first time 
with no spinning wheels. And they don't mind whether it's delivered over a Wi-Fi connection or over a cellular connection. They just want it to work. So the operators which are able to make that perfect connectivity experience absolutely seamless will win out. What I see as a challenge is often you'll have mobile network teams not always talking to the fixed network teams. So integrating those two cultures is really, really important. How do you see the impact now of 5G also on everything which is mobile or remote working? I mean, we're living in a times for sure where everybody of us experienced already home office with all the problems. You were in a conference and you had a bad internet connection, so you yep. barely could hear the other person or they couldn't hear you or whatever. Um, where do you see the impact on 5G on this domain also in the, yeah. in the future? Um, I think, um, so one thing about 5G is the way in which I would roll it out is I would use 5G and also the fixed network as complements and so to hide that though from the consumer. But what that would enable is you always have connectivity, you always have a backup, you always have redundancy going um, into any home. What is um, interesting about how we have worked at home is we haven't really ring-fenced the people who are working. They tend to get lower priority than, let's say, streaming apps, because streaming apps have been designed to work at home, whereas the video calling apps haven't been. So sometimes they get pushed off the connection. And I think what you should have for home working is, um, first of all, you need to have a walled-off connection, so you always have that connectivity, which isn't that great, three megabits per second. The next thing I would do is to have properly hybrid working, you need to be able to see people as you would do in real life. So be able to see all of you rather than just the top of you. So one thing which I've, uh, I've heard many times is people can't tell when, for example, their colleagues, um, female colleagues are expecting a baby because they can't see their belly growing. And so people get embarrassed or women get embarrassed about saying, oh no, I'm about to go off on, on leave. So we are far away from the situation where we have good enough connectivity to do hybrid working. We had good enough connectivity to continue working if you're an information worker, but I think it's more like a sticking plaster, to be realistic. It hasn't iterated massively in the last year. So if home working really worked, we would never have audio dropping out. <laughs> we would never have video dropping out. You would not be able to see the edges between uh, the face and the artificial background behind them. We're a long way from that. that that's reality where we are today. The ideal world. I mean, everybody knows that it yeah. doesn't, most of the time when we really need it, it doesn't work. Let's face it. So that's unfortunately the problem. Um, last question to you also, monetary aspect. Mm. Still, today we have our smartphones. I pay quite a high price for mm. a subscription where I don't necessarily need to worry now about trans, uh, the, the, the data rates. Mm. But still, I know a lot of people who have only 5 gig or 10 gig, maybe mm. something like this. Do you see that in the next two, three, four years this will change so that we're going to have just as home also a connectivity where actually we don't need to worry anymore about the data that we have consumed? That's a really good question. Um, I, and I think one of the underlying questions to that is um, you know, what is the right to connectivity you know, for everyone? Because with every year, as you get more digital, you get more digital divides. That's where we are. And homeschooling has really revealed that and has been sort of like a scar on society because we haven't really addressed that as a society well enough. And so, the, you know, we could say, let's say, legislate to say everybody should have 100 megabits per second. But then it's not just a connection to the home, it's a connection within the home, it's devices that you're using. What do you need so that everybody has a good enough degree of digital capacity? And then with every year, the caliber of digital goes up, let's say, 20, 30 percent. I'm looking at transistor counts. Um, it's 30 percent per year. So you have, to, you have to include an inflation on what the minimum digital availability is. Um, and these are difficult decisions because we can say, you know, like, 20 megabits per second is good enough. But it might be for some applications now, but it won't be in a year's time for some applications. So video calling you know, right now, say, on Zoom is three megabits per second. On other applications, it may be 10. How do you, so, so which, whatever regulation you have has to bear in mind the fact that these are moving targets and always will be until we stop progressing. 
makes perfect sense. So I believe that now the 5G revolution, if I may call it so like this, it's not only the consumer behavior, but it's also exactly those things that we don't see. And <clears throat> that brings me also to the next topic. <clears throat> that, well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> that brings me to the next topic that we are concluding now this first part of uh, this 5G conference from the morning. Um, I'm going to let you go to your coffee break or to your virtual coffee break. Grab a coffee, but first, before you go, please bear with me for a few more minutes because um, a couple of things I would like to tell you still. We are having, right after the coffee break, we're going to start with a very interesting panel discussion about transforming mobility. And that's something which is very interesting because it concerns all of us. I'm not going to reveal too much now because it's going to be very interesting after it, but just simply come back after the panel discussion and especially also after the coffee break and after the lunch break in the afternoon from 2 o'clock on, we're kicking off the different workshops. We have a lot of workshops going on in the afternoon. I hope that you have signed up for them. If not, it's not necessarily too late already, even though we have already workshops which are completely fully booked, like the high performance connectivity for all, fully blocked and the working group covering the topic of Renita in-house coverage inside building, etc. by SMC is also fully booked. Nevertheless, there are a couple of other ones, 5G in healthcare, test innovation by Telindus, simulating 5G for cooperative virtual reality for B2B C, uh, to C, private 5G, the basics of 5G enhanced connectivity, and 5G CROCO results of the first round of tests and trials in a cross-border uh, context, um, they are still available, and not to forget also, you can still also connect virtually. Even if you're here, you have your 5G, of course, with you, so don't be afraid to connect also and to take advantage of the workshops in the afternoon. This said, enjoy your virtual or real coffee. I'm going to see you again in a few minutes, 10.40, right here. Thank you very much. <laughs>